here. Um, just for the record, today is August 4, 2007, and this interview is being conducted during the, um, the Hail and Farewell mm -hmm. National Reunion in uh, Denver, Colorado. Um, and maybe, Pierre, can you give us your full name and your, com your regiment company? And Pierre Delfos, 1st Battalion Headquarters, 85th Mountain Infantry. Pierre, um, I'll just get you started, and if there's anything particular that might come to mind that you want to talk to us about, that's terrific. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it blows your mind when you come here and you see some of your old friends, and you even remember names, you know, that I, I was just talking with uh, one of my old buddies, and I... I told him that I couldn't remember the name of a captain who was a West Pointer. And I said, oh, it's Captain Adams, you know. Out of the blue. I haven't thought of Captain Adams for 50 years, I guess. But uh, it's funny how you... You know, there's a line in, uh, in the musical, Lacage, have you have you've seen the mu musical too? I know about it. Well, I have a wonderful line. It's strange what we remember and odd what we recall. And odd what, no. It's strange what we recall and odd what we forget. That's it. It's in sense. Song of the Sands. Yeah. Well, uh, just to get started, and I know you'll, you'll take off from there, um, what was it about the 10th Mountain Division that got you interested in joining that? I didn't even know about the 10th Mountain. Uh, I was at Fort Dix, New Jersey. I was there for 30 days and usually in and out in three or four days. And I was told that they were waiting to get a group together to go to Camp Hill, Colorado for the ski troops. And I had been a skier and had to put that down as a hobby, not even knowing there was a group like that. And uh, I was going to be the Acting corporal, that was a big deal to take the, about 18 young kids who was, I was 26 and these kids were 17 and 18. And we, we took the trains out of Trenton, New Jersey, headed west through St. Louis. We made that, was our first stop where we changed trains. And then we uh, went on to Pando, Colorado, which was a big shock at 10,000 feet. And uh, all of us were surprised by the elevation. And I remember the first night that we went out, we, we had a relay race before dinner, not knowing what would happen at 10,000 feet. And I remember walking into the mess hall and looking at a plate of spaghetti and walked right out again. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't think of eating it. Yeah. When was it, when were you shipped over to Italy? To Italy, mm -hmm. I went over with the troops on the West Point. Uh, it was end of December, yeah, Chris, yeah, end of December, and uh, we went by the Rock of Gibraltar on January 10th, which was my birthday. Yeah, I remember. As you remember, certain things have come very clearly to you. Yeah, and then into Naples, and I, re I remember. Virtually everything from hitting, hitting Naples, seeing the, the people asking for cigarettes and chocolate. We never got off the, off the ship there. We went on to a, a small craft that took us up to uh, Livorno, to Leghorn. So we never got, our group never got off uh, the water. And at, the, at Leghorn we got, we were taken by, by uh, vehicles, army trucks, over to uh, Pisa, where they, the uh, the king had had his summer palace, and we were on the on his summer grounds there, and then we all uh, every opportunity got over to the seat, leaning power of Pisa, but that's where we started, mm -hmm. and from there my group went to Bonnie de Luca, and we were in the Bonnie de Luca for I guess about three weeks before we headed for combat, and that was on February the. 
18th, we got we went into uh, the location ready for the assault on February the 19th. Mm -hmm. That I remember very clearly. You want to talk about that? Yeah. It was a, a, a time of, of great concern, you know, not knowing what was ahead of us. Uh, I remember there was a, a building, a single building there uh, made of, of brick, and Colonel Woolley asked me, he didn't tell me, he asked me, he said, Dell, would you go over and look and see if there's anybody in there? I said, yeah. Suddenly it occurred to me, you know, there could be crowds in this building. Or it could be booby trapped. But I went anyway, and there was a man and a woman in the bed there. And the man said to me, that's my Sorella, his, daughter, his sister. He was in bed with his sister, but <laughs> that's what he said. And I, uh, everything was okay. He could have been a crowd, and I wouldn't know it. You know? That was my beginning of the, the first assault on on Belvedere. Did, uh, did you go up Belvedere? I went up after being, I was an S3 sergeant, which meant I was with battalion headquarters, and we moved after the, after the troops went up. We followed them. So I, I, I was relatively safe. What was your responsibility? As an S3 sergeant, as maps, knowing the maps, uh, being able to make uh, sketches of the area. Uh, uh, there you had your, your four groups. You had your S1, which was administration, your S2, which is intelligence, your S3, which took care of my job, and the S4 was, uh, uh, that was your, your supply. Your, your. But we, we followed the troops, and uh, f fortunately, uh, we got through all right. Until I hit Villa, Villa Franca, which was uh, uh, north of the Po Valley, and in April, uh, I was on a jeep with, I, with my company commander. It was getting dark. I, I stepped off the jeep. The jeep went off, and a, a three-quarter ton squeezed me against the wa a rock wall, and I ended up in the evac hospital. And then in the hospital in, uh, in Bologna, hospital in, uh, the next one was uh, in Livorno, and then eventually to uh, Naples. And then uh, Naples, they flew me out, Aravac, into North Africa, onto uh, Bermuda, and into uh, Fort Lauderdale. California, uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And there, this is another strange, I remember every aspect of that trip, but how I got from Florida to Aurora, California, which is Fitzsimmons Hospital, I haven't the slightest idea. I don't remember that at all, just wash out. So I came to Fitzsimmons and I was discharged on, uh, I think, the 15th of October in 45. How badly were you injured? Well, enough that they, they still pay me now $140 a month or something. But I was badly injured. But I would say for about a year that uh, I really had back, back injury and a dislocated shoulder. But all in all, I was lucky. It could have, could have been much worse than that. How did you feel about making it that far through the war and then Well, injured. that was a big disappointment because the war was over in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, that was roughly April the 15th and 16th in Villa Franca. And uh, I, was, I was disappointed there. But on the other hand, I was, I was kind of happy because the guys in my unit, the headquarters company, said they were going to get me drunk when, if we ever got out of the war. <laughs> I wouldn't want to do that. And as you, you may have heard, in Villa Franca they came upon a chest that was, uh, had over $300,000 worth of, of money if it exchanged for American cur allied currency. It was in Italian lira. I don't know if you've ever heard the story. Sergeant Case, who was the S1 sergeant, and the, Jeep, the Colonel's Jeep driver, 
went into the airfield in Villa Franca and they went into one of the buildings and they found a German payroll. It was all in Italian lira. It was in a chest and they took the chest with them in the jeep, took it to Colonel Woolley who was the battalion commander, asked him what they, he should do with it. He said, put a blanket over it and forget about it until we decide what we'll do. And General Hayes came in and sat on the chest. <laughs> Nothing happened. But by the time the 1st Battalion headquarters got moved up after the war, they began counting the money. And they realized they had over $300,000. If they could transfer it from Italian currency into Allied currency. And that was a problem. And they decided that they tried to get Italian na natives to uh, go into stores and exchange it for Allied currency with where the Br Brits and the Americans had been spending their money. Sergeant Case bought a hotel and a diamond ring. Everybody came out, with it. that was the guys in the battalion who were anything. One of the guys told me he came out with $20,000 eventually. But there's a part of the story that no one knows except myself. And that is in 19, roughly 19, in the 60s, I had lunch with a group of buyers. I was in the toy industry. I had lunch with a group of buyers and I told them this story. And a man by the name of Smith, who was a, the head buyer for the Allied department stores, said, Pierre, I know the rest of the story. He said, I was with the 5th Army in the Finance Department and I was asked if I would consider some way to transfer uh, Italian Lira into American, cur American cur currency or Allied currency for a certain percentage of the... He said, you know, we stood over that, the few guys in, in the Finance Department, we stood over that for about three or four days before we decided it was too hot an issue. And we, we said no. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that strange? Yeah, uh, the stories come about. But at any rate, that was, that was one of the highlights of my life. And uh, Wilton Case came back to the United States. He, had to, he couldn't sell a hotel, nobody would buy it from him. He came back with $10,000 and a diamond ring. That's what he got out of it. And I know that because I had lunch with Wilton Casey. <laughs> he lived in New Jersey and this is after the war. Yeah. You never heard that story. <laughs> yeah. Do you, um, other than that one, are there any other memorable experiences that you might want to recount? Most of them were, were funny. I have a very peculiar sense of humor. I never, I never took life too seriously. And I remember before crossing the Po, the, the troops were marching, were moving along both sides of a dirt road, getting toward the Po. And one of the guys, his name was, think of it in a moment, Don McNeil of B Company, looked up in the balcony. He said, there was a priest that was blessing all of the troops. You know, the big black hat. Have you ever seen pictures of the big black hat in the robe? He said, that's Delphos. That's Delphos. <laughs> I was blessing the troops. <laughs> <laughs> they, they all thought I was, I was a padre up there. I'd found this, this hat in the robe. Uh, it was, that was one of, the, one of the funniest things that happened. <laughs> oh, did you, did you know he was saying that he was, did you know what he was saying about No, I didn't know, I didn't know. Mac, McNeil told me this at one of the conventions. He went to all the conventions. Unfortunately, he's dead now. But he always, re always told that story at the convention <laughs> that he spotted me. <laughs> he was in B Company. Yeah. So the, but my highlights were, were low lights. They really were, were strange things that happened. And the only negative thing that I can remember 
was seeing one of our, uh, our medics with a bullet hole through his helmet, through the Red Cross in his helmet. And I knew him, he was a German refugee and he, he was dead. And I don't know for how many hours, but you could see that the spirit had gone out of him, the color had changed. And I knew you know, that was the only sad, really sad experience that I personally had. And then another, there was a, a Carl Karakis. I don't know if you've ever heard the name, but he, he took over at B Company when the, uh, the B Company f uh, commander was, uh, was knocked out, was killed. And Carl Karakis, there, was, there were three brothers from, from Michigan. One brother, the oldest brother, was discharged when we were at Camp Swift. They didn't want three brothers going over together. The next brother, the, uh, the oldest brother of all was Lloyd, uh, the second oldest, Lloyd. And Lloyd, Lloyd was killed overseas. And Carl saw a jeep coming by with a body bag and he knew instinctively that it was his brother. And it was, he saw the, the tag on the, on the bag. And he came in that night to battalion headquarters where I was. And we, we had been pals, the, th the three brothers and I. And he said, Dell, he said, my brother's gone, he was, I, he was killed today. And uh, uh, that was a tough night. Uh, those are the things you remember. Some of the funny things and some of the sad. And Carl was supposed to be here tonight. We had promised each other that we would be here. And he was killed in an automobile accident in December. He was, it was snowing and he got, he slid off the road and hit a tree and was killed in, in Michigan. And his wife told me that he was getting a, a, a touch of dementia. Alzheimer's, and she didn't know whether that had something to do with it or it was just the icy roads. But we had big plans to, to meet here, not to, not to be. Pierre, did you have any interaction with the Italian people? Say that again? Did you have any interaction with the Italian people? Oh, very much so. Yeah, because when we were in Bonnie de Luca, uh, there's a family by the name of Bracci. I was walking in the mountains one day and I met a woman with a stack of twigs on her head and in broken English she told me that her husband once lived in brr, 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 Chicago. <laughs> yes, that's where she told me and that I should come to see them, that he was a banker in Bonnie de Luca. So I went over, I guess the next evening, and shared some of the wine, and the Bracci's then became my good friends. I would bring them soap, saponi, you know. They loved it. They had a daughter, Nara, who was about 14, and a younger son, Roy, who was about 10. And every night I'd go over to the Bracci's house. He spoke very good English, and he had been in the doll industry, and I'd been in the toy industry. So we had that connection. Uh, P.S. After the war, I went over to Italy with my wife, and of course we went to Bonnie de Luca, and we went to see the Bracci's. On the way to the Bracci's, we saw one of the gendarmes, one of the policemen who knew me from Bonnie de Luca, and he said, Pietro, you've got to stay with us. I said, well, I've got to see the Bracci's before I can make any arrangements. He said, if the Bracci's don't take you, come and stay with us. So I parked my car at the Catholic Church, which is about a quarter of a mile from the house, and I went to the Bracci's, oh, Pietro, I couldn't believe it, you know, that he'd come. And after much conversation, you've got to stay with us, so we agreed to stay with them for a couple of nights. And he said, where is your luggage? I said, it's down by the church, I'll, I'll go get it. He said, you sure don't get it, the luggage I send to my wife. <laughs> 
<laughs> so Mrs. Pachi went with me <laughs> to carry the luggage up. <laughs> yes, I have a lot of a lot of very clear memories of what happened. Certain ones. Other things have passed away. I remember the boat trip that we stayed on deck as much as we could not to get sick. And we, I was with the intelligence section who were part of headquarters company. We used to sit on the deck and play chess with a little miniature chess games. A number of the, about three of the intelligence sergeants were German refugees. They were intellectuals, all of them, but they had escaped Germany and uh, they, uh, we would play chess with them all the time. And, uh, and their, their sergeant, who was the head of their intelligence section, was killed overseas. And he's killed in April, I see. And that, that was another bad thing for us. But uh, also I remember that in order to survive, you, the only thing I would eat was bread and jam and tea. I, would, I didn't, didn't stay away from meat and everything. <laughs> and then you go, go through the chow line and that's what you get. You get a couple of pieces of bread and jam and, and a canteen full of tea. And I wanted to get, you couldn't get back in line again. So I would grab a mop and start swabbing the, the deck there as though I was one of the workers there in the kitchen on KP <laughs> to get back in line. That's how, I, that's how I got extra food. I survived that way. <laughs> yeah, crazy. Yeah. What do you, how do you feel, how would you define the 10th Mountain Division today? Unique. Nothing like it. My, I tell my friends about it, and they've never heard of a unit that that stayed together like this. Uh, how could you? How could you possibly Peter, just? You yes, dear, go on. You have to stay in the picture, so you need to sit uh, back. And oh, okay. <laughs> okay, that's good. Okay. Uh, we, the fact that we are held together. And not by monetary means at all. You know, there's, money isn't uh, has no effect. You can't retire on anything. And we, but we, I happen to be one of the uh, me members of uh, that. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, paid for the. It's the paid per, per, you have a name for it. Permanent. Uh, I'm a member forever. In it. Tenth, uh, tenth, what do you call it? Um, <laughs> no, you're not an honorary. Yeah, I'm a, life, I'm a lifetime member. Yeah, a lifetime member, which, which I've saved a lot of money because I don't pay every year. But anyway, uh, and you have a long list of people who are lifetime members. I mean, and where do you get an organization where families, my son is here. He, he, Peter is a, is a doctor and he, he wanted very much to come especially because it was going to be the last time, and he's a member of the, of the uh, family. But uh, you cannot explain it. It is just a unique situation. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any other. I've talked to guys who are in the Navy, guys who are Marines and, and the Army, that they don't have any, any organization like this. Yeah. We're, we're descendants, for example, outnumber by far the um, the members. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much, Pierre. It was a wonderful interview. You, uh, well, you're you're sweet, but uh, to to remind me of the uh, of so many things, and then uh, I bet, uh, uh, in fact, the oldest member of the uh, of the men was 94. Years a, and that's Herb Wright. When they, they, everybody stood up and find out, well, I'm one of the 90s. I think there were 12 people who were 90. And Herb Wright was the oldest at 94, and he was well, another a jokester. Colonel Woolley, who was our battalion commander, said, Delfos, when Herb Wright was commissioned as a, as a captain, he was a, a, second, a first lieutenant, Colonel Woolley said, Make captain's bars and make them as big as you can and put them on Herb's helmet. We'll hold it here. 
So when he comes, you know, the worst thing you can have is for the enemy to see any kind of mark on your helmet. So we gave her that, that helmet with the great big captains. I used adhesive tape to make it. <laughs> and uh, he still remembers that. It was, yeah, yeah. And Colonel Woolley was, was a wonderful, wonderful leader. Colonel Parler was too. He was, he was our regimental commander. Uh, I remember being in the barracks one night and the phone rang and I was going to say something like, uh, oh, this is the Dell's funeral home or something stupid, you know, and I didn't. You got to remember the sign on the wall that said, that, you, don't open your mouth, you know, the more you talk, enemy will hear. And uh, it was Colonel Barlow, of course, wanting to ask something. <laughs> you know the story about the, the cross bayonets, have you heard it a hundred times? Do you know that we wanted cross skis and the Pentagon said, no, you can't have cross skis, oh, it were, but you can have cross bayonets because the enemy will know right away that you're ski troops. So we have cross bayonets. But when we arrived in Italy, we were bombarded by leaflets that said, welcome to sunny Italy. It's a long way from Camp Hale, Colorado. Give yourself up now and you'll see the end of the war, safe and sound. And one other story I re recall, I was with Captain uh, Hart, Jim Hart, and, and Lieutenant Jim Lund, we had gotten a hold of a Percheron horse and a big wagon, and the, wagon, and the Italian guy to lead the horse. And the wagon was filled with ammo and with sea rations. And we're walking along, this is south of the Po, we're walking along the road, the dirt road, and on both sides of the road, it, the land drops off so that the, the, the that would, area which would be planted. And suddenly out of nowhere, a plane came and strafed us. We heard it coming, we all dove off to the side of the road. And there was a, a run or a messenger for the captain, and he was shot in the finger, that was all. But we had a mess, and the horse wasn't hit. But we had a mess of garbage, you can imagine, sea rations. The next day we learned that it had been friendly fire. It was one of our own planes, and they had seen this vehicle going along. And I must admit, I, was, I never wore a helmet. I always wore my ski cap, and my pants were rolled up. I, would never, I was always out of uniform. <laughs> and they apparently saw me and the mistook us for, for a German vehicle, yeah. Uh -huh. We got straight. Yeah. Pierre, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to end. You got to go. That's yeah, fine. I, I, it was fun. I apologize. It was so <laughs> interesting. Myrna told me how interesting oh. you were. And um, I, so I'm so sorry we didn't have more time in this. But I tell you, I've always had fun. People say, how are you doing at night? And I say, I'm still having fun.